Hi, everybody. My name is Rackley, and I'm a VP of Core Innovation at Capital One, where I'm responsible for the creation of modern cloud-native core banking platforms. In 2016, I wrote a book with several co-authors about microservice architecture. It seems like enough people seem to have liked it that I'm actually currently writing a second book uh, with my co-author, Ronnie Mitra, and that book will be published later this year in November. Uh, today, I would like to share with you a design process for APIs and microservices that I have been working on the bits and pieces of over the course of the last decade. I have successfully implemented various versions of it uh, at different companies where I have worked. I've actually uh, taught it at the university as part of the distributed computing course. And uh, it is also described in much more detail in that microservices up and running book that I mentioned. So in this design system, uh, the one that I'm going to share with you, it's a top-down, multi-step methodology and a collection of reusable processes, where each later step evolves from a previous one. Due to its evolutionary nature, we call the system uh, seven essential evolutions of design for services, or much more short term, we call it SEEDS. This tongue-in-cheek name is actually quite fitting because um, the analysis performed with this methodology often proved to be the essential seeds, no pun intended, from which a beautiful complex microservices and API-driven systems can emerge. It all starts with identifying the actors, the participants of the interactions we're trying to model with the APIs or services. Main motivator for starting modeling with the definition of actors is to aid in scoping and prioritization. The typical plague of API and service design in our industry is over abstraction and lack of clarity regarding user needs. Too many APIs are simply exposures of some database tables over HTTP or an attempt to provide direct network access into application internals, let's say with gRPC. Such lazy and, uh, I would say, naive approach to service design is seldom successful. And that should not be surprising if we don't even bother to ask who will be using this API and what are their needs, or can we possibly design solutions that solve for the needs of this people? So, uh, on the screen, you're seeing a, a kind of an imaginary, uh, fake, completely fake uh, application. So we're going to be using throughout this presentation to explain the seven-step design process. And uh, the premise of this application is, let's imagine that it's some kind of uh, digital coin exchange wallet application. How would we design API for it? So in this application, some of the actors you could identify are, let's say, Digicoin customer. Uh, it could be a Digicoin wallet, and it could be the Digicoin, the actual application that somebody is using. So once we understand the actors, we should understand their needs. Uh, here we assert that APIs are products. There were a whole bunch of presentations in this conference where people talked about how APIs are products, we, and we really believe in that, so we want to embrace it. So if we assert that APIs are products, then their design can benefit from product design best practices. Right? So one of those is Professor Clayton Christensen's uh, Jobs to be Done framework, in which Professor Christensen claims that customers find products useful mostly because they have specific jobs to be done. And the products that they employ the system in getting those jobs done. Therefore, useful products emerge when we understand customers' jobs to be done. So if we uh, likewise want to design useful APIs, we should probably understand the jobs that they afford to get done, those APIs uh, afford to get done to its users. Uh, to make the whole design process repeatable, we capture jobs to be done that we learn usually from customer interviews in a standard format, right? So from one API design to the other API design. We want this to be a repeatable process. So we use a standard format, specifically a 
jobs to be done a story template that was created by Paul Adams. And there's a link uh, at the bottom of the slide if you want to read more about that uh, in the blog post about the template. But generally, uh, in this template, we very importantly identify the circumstance of the job, the motivation, and the goal. And the template itself goes like, when circumstance, I want to motivation, so I can go. So let's look at some examples to understand this approach. So some of the jobs to be done um, in this template for the DigiCoin application could be when a customer wants to buy coin, so the context is the customer wants to buy coins, they want to see current price of a coin. So the motivation is to see current price of a coin and so that they can estimate their buying power. So the goal is to estimate the buying power. The motivation is to see the price of the coin. Likewise, another job to be done could be when a customer initiates coin purchase, they need to add or reuse a payment method so that they can provide funds for their purchase. Right? And you may notice a lot of people do uh, some kind of agile methodology these days. You may notice these stories are quite similar to Scrum stories. But it's important to notice the difference, right? In a Scrum story, it starts with a persona. So as a somebody, I do something. In a jobs to be done uh, template and in a jobs to be done theory in general, the circumstance is much more important than a persona, right? So we identify the actors so we can then find the jobs. But once we're describing the jobs, it's the circumstance under which we're trying to get this job done that is much more important than the persona. So there are differences between jobs to be done template and the Scrum story. Okay, so after we go through that exercise, through that step, we're going to have a list of jobs to be done. And that's really great. That takes us really far in understanding what we're designing. However, in complex situations, um, interactions in the world are too sophisticated, usually, to describe a model with a simple list of jobs to be done. We usually need to design an interaction diagram. We need to understand the interactions. Uh, and these interactions explain the sequence of events between various actors in the system. Uh, in the spirit of reusing existing methodologies, you can design this interaction any way you want, but because we already have a very powerful tool to describing interactions, I usually use UML sequence diagrams for designing that. Uh, more importantly, on the screenshot, you see that uh, you can design a UML diagram using uh, a text. Uh, which is something I really enjoy. I can never design the sequence diagrams in, a, in any graphic editor, but there is a, a language called uh, Plant UML. There are others, but I, I use usually Plant UML. And using Plant UML, uh, you can textually uh, describe interactions, which is very convenient because then I can also collaborate. Right? As, as far as my source code is text, uh, I can I can commit it to GitHub. I can share it with my collaborators, and they can. Um, create pull requests to it. So in that very collaborative way, we can work on a sequence diagram. And then I can visualize it, the variety of tools. There are many tools that I can visualize at Plant UML source. Um, the one that I like a lot is this thing called liveuml.com, which is used uh, to uh, render the uh, rendering that you see on your screen. It's a free web-based application. You can also install it locally. And uh, that's how we go about understanding the sequences involved in an API interaction uh, most of the time. So once we have that, so now we have the jobs to uh, be done and we have the sequence diagram, we understand a lot about what we're trying to design. But um, the job stories provide great format for conversations with your customers, right? Uh, with a subject and another experts, but they're not actually very useful for designing or deriving technical um, uh, design. But they're a little bit more on the business side. Therefore, what we do after we have the interactions and we have the uh, jobs to be done, we recommend translating them in what I call the queries and actions for the APIs, which is what the fourth step of the SEEDS process is all about. It's all about identifying queries and actions. So what are queries and actions? Uh, queries are lookups um, with defined inputs and outputs. It should be a well-understood contract between the client and the server 
what input is client sending and what response they expect. Queries are, you know, the way that queries are different from actions, queries do not modify the system. There are no side effects, right? It's just a question I ask with a known input and an expected output. Actions, on the other hand, are requests to cause some sort of state modification in the system. They do have side effects. Uh, they also have well-defined contract in the sense that they have an input. And usually, you do define expected uh, outcome of an action. So let's look at some examples of queries um, in Digicoins and the same Digicoins application. So one query based on the jobs to be done and interactions we showed could be look up a coin price. So the input of that could be a digital coin identification, so kind of like the currency identifier, and the traditional currency code. So let's say I want to know how many Bitcoins or what portion of a Bitcoin I can uh, buy with US dollars, right? So that US dollars and the Bitcoin would be the input, and the response would be the current conversion rate. Uh, another uh, query I could have in the system is a lookup of existing payment methods, right? At some point, I will have to pay for a Bitcoin. It's, which is not really a thing anymore, not many people do that, but if you are into that kind of thing and you are really buying Bitcoins, then you need some way to pay for it. So the system, the wallet needs to look up uh, the payment methods and uh, it would require something like user identifier, payment type, uh, and the response would be uh, possibly some kind of unique identifier and the details of the payment. Uh, let's look at an example of an action. So an example of an action could be actually charge a payment method to fund my coin purchase, right? So now that I have really decided I do have to, I do need to buy this coin, this way I can uh, buy a coin by providing a payment method identifier amount and the currency. And the expected outcome is going to be the money will actually be withdrawn from my credit card or the debit card or whatever I use for this purpose. So that's queries and actions. So uh, we'll identify the list of actions and queries bring, uh, bring you very close to achieving the goal of designing effective APIs and services. But they do not usually contain enough detail for actual implementation. In the next step of the SIS process, you should take actions and queries and produce a proper standard documentation standard spec for an API. You can use whatever format you want for the uh, API spec, but uh, I personally, a lot of times use for RESTful APIs, I use open API specification. You can use RAML or something else, but as long as it's a standard specification in which uh, you can describe in great detail your API design, that's what this next step is about. Taking actions and queries that already give you a lot of information of what you're trying to design, and now translating that into some kind of standard specification. Like I said, the open API specification um, is great for RESTful APIs. Uh, it is technology agnostic, right? It doesn't matter what you end up then uh, implementing this API in, whether it's like C Sharp or Golang or Node.js or whatever it is. Uh, you will still be able to describe your API in a standard way. For non-RESTful APIs, because those are not the only APIs, you can use other more fitting um, approaches, right? So for, for instance, if you're designing a GraphQL API, you'll probably use GraphQL specification to describe it. The initial version of the API and service design as captured by some standard specification, let's say open API specification description, is an important milestone, right? Uh, once you have that, you are very close to saying, I kind of have my API design. But there is more modeling work that is necessary for a well-designed API, not just a designed API, but for a well-designed API. And this is true because unfortunately, most teams rush into implementation before they get a chance to receive any external feedback on their designs. Right? So they have thought about it, they, they have talked to the customers, they have maybe understood the requirements, and now they are eager to code and they rush into the code. But it's still too early to code. 
because what we need to do is before we spend all of that time and money in turning our design into code, we should probably show somebody our design and get some feedback. Coding without uh, getting feedback, coding without proving our designs by an independent third party developer, most uh, uh, the best is to talk to people who will be using your API, or at least to talk to people who usually use APIs, who are more like client developers. You definitely want to talk to mobile developers because they usually have a, a specific take that uh, some other developers don't. Um, if you don't do that, then it will lead to significant amount of waste. It will lead to subpar designs. If you're building an API that you really care about the design of, its design is not done until you receive significant feedback from outside developers. As a matter of fact, we used to say that a design of the API is not done until somebody tries to implement a client that conforms to its API design. But at the very least, you should um, be getting some feedback before you get into the coding. So that is the penultimate step of designing your APIs, seeking the feedback on your design. And only once you are done with all of those steps, should you sit down and start thinking about what databases do I use to implement this, what languages do I use, only then you should start actually implementing your APIs. So that's what the seven essential evolutions of design for services or the SEEDS methodology is. It's an evolutionary process that allows you to design repeatedly and consistently various APIs and various microservices. It's a methodology that, may, that brings a lot of predictability, a lot of repeatability in your process, and in our experience leads to really well-designed services, better designed services than uh, if you are not using any methodology. Thank you very much. This is all I had to share today, and I hope you enjoyed this talk as much as I enjoyed giving it.